about a month ago, I was watching Cuphead on Netflix with my daughter, and I actually found the show to be exceptionally well done and very close to its game counterpart. I had bought Cuphead for her a few months after its debut. The cartoon? I think it did justice to both formats. But as we talked about the cartoon, she says to me how cool it must be to see cartoons about a video game. I told her, you know what, this isn't something new. And she just glanced over with a fear of dread in her face and said, they had cartoons about video games back in the 80s? I just smiled. And so this idea for the video was born. Let's talk about some games and the shows that they inspired. Grab some popcorn, some raisinets, and a big drink. This video, it's a long one. So back in the early 80s, arcades were still taking off as the next video game platform while technology progressed in that field. But in July of 1980, there was one game that none expected. A game that not only incorporated the new technology in the arcades, but injected into it something even the newest tech of that time could not have anticipated. Characters. Pac-Man had brought to the arcade something that the medium had been missing since day one, a title character, something that the player could relate to. No longer tied down to just ping pong paddles, racing cars, or even battling tanks. No, no, no. Pac-Man was a breath of fresh air and a start of another revolution in the early days of video games. Games were also no longer subjected to remain as part of consoles and arcades. With the explosion in popularity, Pac-Man broke down many barriers. Merchandising was just one of them. But some folks out there saw other opportunities. TV, specifically Saturday morning cartoons. They were the main reason why every kid in America waited for that day to come every week. That was the reason why kids woke up willingly at 7 a.m. on the weekend. I was actually one of them. Advertisers and channel networks saw the dollar signs in that possible venture, and Pac-Man was their ticket to the big show. It was the first animated TV show based on a video game on its release in September of 1982. This cartoon helped create a new offset of merchandising, one based off an offshoot of the original medium. So parents were no longer buying a game or a toy based directly on the game, but on merchandise based on a TV show that was based off of a video game. This was a whole new territory to be exploited. This show ran for two seasons on ABC all the way to 1983, producing a total of 42 episodes and one Christmas special. Hanna-Barbera was not aware of it, but they had just kicked off the cartoon video game revolution. Now when CBS saw the great impact that Pac-Man had for its network and the advertisers, they wanted a piece of the pie as well. well can you blame them? They released the Saturday Supercade segment in 1983. It consisted of five shows. Qbert, Frogger, Donkey Kong, Donkey Kong Jr., and Pitfall, all made by Ruby Spears Enterprises. Notice how Pitfall is the only show not based off an arcade, but rather the Atari 2600 game. I guess they couldn't think of another arcade game that would transition over to the TV side? Who knows? Kind of hard to accept seeing as how they made a whole show out of a game where a frog crosses the road and an orange looking alien just hops on squares. To me, the Frogger show was the weak link in the bunch. When you gotta have a story, oh, you gonna lose your job. When there's no escape from the danger, and you're working for a frog, so you get a little shell shock, and a fanny helping too. In the show, Frogger is a reporter for a newspaper and he and his friends go off in search of stories. I'm surprised they even got that much off the game content available. This cartoon only had 13 episodes. Donkey Kong. The 
Donkey Kong one was my favorite. It was basically centered around Mario and Pauline just trying to capture that stubborn yet slow-witted gorilla. Little trivia, Stanley from Donkey Kong 3 makes an appearance as a side character in the episode Greenhouse Gorilla. The Donkey Kong show had a total of 19 episodes. Cubert was set in a 1950s themed world where Cubert and his friends just attend school and have several adventures. They do manage to shoo in certain game features, the rainbow colored discs being a big one used extensively in the cartoon. Little trivia here, Frank Welker voiced many of the bad guys in this cartoon. The same guy who voiced Scooby Doo and tons of other cartoon characters throughout the years. This show here had 19 episodes. Donkey Kong Jr. is centered around Donkey Kong Jr. trying to find his dad, Donkey Kong, after he comes to America and finds his cage empty. So he was aware he was imprisoned? Or was he coming to free him? Regardless of the plot, he teams up with a human named Bones, who reminds me a bit of the Fonz from Happy Days. The two embark on many adventures as they ride Bones' bike through many towns in search of Donkey Kong. And by many adventures, I mean 13. There's only 13 episodes, that's it. Last one is Pitfall. The premise here is that Pitfall Harry is in search of treasure through many locations around the world. He brings along his niece Rhonda and his pet lion Quick Claw, and they have many adventures. That's pretty much it. This one only had 7 episodes. Little trivia with this one is that Rhonda and Quick Claw would go on to appear in the future title Pitfall 2. In season 2 of Supercade, they got rid of Frogger, thank goodness, Pitfall, and Donkey Kong Jr. In their place, they brought in two new titles, Kangaroo and Space Ace. Joey, Joey, kangaroo. Kangaroo takes place inside a zoo with Katie the mom and her son Joey. Get it? Because he's a baby, you know, can Never mind. So they try to keep the monkey gang from escaping the zoo. The premise obviously is a bit different from the game, where in it the monkeys kidnap your son and you have to rescue him. I think that would have been a bit too much for kids, you know, tackling kidnapping as a subject. Anyway, this one here only had 13 episodes. Space Ace, Defender of the Galaxy. Together with his partner Kimberly, they battle the forces of the evil force who seeks to conquer Earth with his dreaded Infanto Ray. Space Ace is pretty much like the game, it just centers around Ace and his colleague Kimberly as they battle the evil Borf. They couldn't come up with a better name than Borf, really? The part that is not like the game is that Ace tends to transform between being a kid and his superhero type Ace personality sporadically. Of course, this is done to better deliver punchlines and make situations more difficult for the title character. Surprised they didn't include Dragon Slayer instead of this one since I always saw Dragon Slayer as the more popular of the two arcades. This one only had 13 episodes as well. You know, speaking of Dragon Slayer, I guess they did see it as the more popular of the two arcades since this one actually got its standalone cartoon in 1984. I mean, how could it not? The arcade was just blowing up the gaming landscape when it came out. I will be honest here, I never saw this one or I never even knew it existed until after maybe the 2000s. This one was done by the same studio that did Supercade. Basically, it follows Dirk as he protects the kingdom from the same bad guys as in the game. I saw a few episodes and I kind of understand as to why it only lasted 13 episodes. I didn't last 13 episodes, that's for sure. A waste of potential, in my opinion. From now on, like your parents were, you are the secret force of pole position. They're moving real fast, they're the only ones who Let's can get go, there on time. Okay, sis. And never too far behind, they are always fighting crime. Ready when you are, Rhodey.
In that same year, the same animation studio released Pole Position. Now, the first thing you think is, how the hell do you make a cartoon out of an indie car racing game? By the way, let me say that this intro here is one of the best cartoon intros of the 80s. Real catchy tune too. This one follows the story of a crime fighting family called the Darrits, who just so happen to own various vehicles with enough add-ons to make James Bond squeal. Now, they work undercover using the name Pole Position for their stunt work company, which happens to be funded by the US government. I mean, what the? Who came up with this stuff anyway? None of these vehicles are in the game. In fact, the game only has two things similar to the show. One is that it has vehicles that have four wheels. Two, it has the name Pole Position. That's it. Here's the part I don't get. Why is it no one, and I mean no one, has translated this show into a freaking game. Can you imagine it? A game where you have access to various spy agent worthy cars as you try to fight crime around the world? The one cool part I liked about the show was the car computers which could be detached from the vehicle. Why hasn't anyone done that in real cars? That would be awesome. This show here only had 13 episodes and it was created by DIC Studios. Man, how my friends and I would laugh every time that logo popped up on the screen. After Pole Position, we would not see another video game cartoon until 1989. This is when Nintendo was on top of the world. So naturally, we got the Super Mario Super Show, cause... Did I mention Nintendo was on top of the world? He's back. Hey, Paisanos, it's the Super Mario Brothers Super Show! We're with the Mario Brothers and plumbing's a game. We're not like the others who get all the fame. If your sink is in trouble, you can call us on the double. We're faster than the others, you'll be hooked on the brothers. The cartoon is basically Mario and Luigi having all sorts of adventures in the Mushroom Kingdom. Some episodes even mock famous films. Lots of episodes made little sense, even as a kid. And that's not a good thing. The animation was also horrendous at times. It was just awful, awful stuff. I never understood how Mario touches a star but gets the fire upgrade. Yeah, I know. I need a life. How Nintendo greenlit this is still beyond me. Pretty sure they're gonna learn from their mistakes for future reference. As a really young kid, this cartoon might have hit home on some levels. It ran as an animated segment within the live action Super Mario show. 52 episodes would be made for this show, which were created by the Say Young Animation Studio, which was located in South Korea. And as a kid, I eagerly awaited Friday to come, because Monday through Thursdays belonged to Mario. But not on Friday. Oh, no, 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 no. Friday, that was the day the Legend of Zelda cartoon would take its place in the show. This is the Triforce of Wisdom, Link. The evil wizard Ganon has the Triforce of Power. Whoever gets both Triforces will rule this land forever! You must help me, Link! Hey, for you, Zelda, anything! The first week that show came out was pure torture for me because I waited all weekend for Friday to arrive. So I can watch a cartoon that was based on one of my favorite action RPGs of all time. Then, it happened. It was sudden, it was jaw-dropping, it was traumatizing. Yup, he opens his mouth. Excuse me, princess! The cartoon was tied to the game uh, somewhat loosely, except for the dark brown hair and the princess looking nothing like she did in the games and the whole Triforce thing. The rest of the characters and locations were eh, somewhat okay for the most part. Ooh, one thing I forgot to mention is that both cartoons used many game sound effects directly from the games and worked them into the cartoons as sound effects. So it was kind of cool to hear them as you watch both shows. 
This cartoon was done by DIC Studios and only 13 were made. Well, excuse me, princess. 1990 saw the emergence of one of the last video game cartoons I would watch as a kid. Captain N and the Game Master took many video game properties and brought them under one umbrella. And to me, as a kid, uh, that was just an idea that had unlimited potential. I mean, think about it. Here was a cartoon that was not tied down to one gaming universe or set of characters. With the creation of new games constantly, there was almost no limit as to what the storytellers could do. The cartoon was centered around Kevin who, I don't know, for some reason he just gets transported to video land along with his dog. He just happens to be wearing a high school sports jacket with a letter N on it. Boy, what a coincidence. Along with Pitt, who is called Kid Icarus for some reason in the cartoon a horrible, and I mean horrible, version of Mega Man. And as if the writers or animators were in some sort of a battle to outdo the other in terms of shitty character designs, an even worse version of Simon Belmont. Now they, along with Princess Lana, okay, yeah, Princess Lana, they would battle Mother Brain and her minions. Why is it the bad guys were pretty close to the original designs, but not the heroes? I, that kind of pissed me off. Anyway, the show ran for 34 episodes and was made by DIC Studios. Small trivia here, it was called Captain N since the studio could not use the word Nintendo. See, back in 1989, Congress was in the process of implementing strict rules that would culminate into the Children's TV Act of 1990. Basically what that means is shows could not be used as mask commercials for kids. Even though the show came out before the law was in place, producers didn't take a chance and they kind of knew what was coming down the pipeline. If the word Nintendo had been used, the show might not have gotten the go-ahead to televise, so the N-word was never mentioned in the show. Ever. Even though the show bastardized many video game characters, the overall animation and storylines were pretty good and entertaining for the half-hour slot it occupied. Pops, check out my new bat flip. Okay, now seriously, did someone at DIC Studios hate Konami? Is that it? I mean, that right there takes pure hatred to create. Pure hatred. The same studio of Stay Young returned and brought us The Adventures of Super Mario Bros. 3. Such an odd title. Why wasn't it called Super Mario Bros. 3 The Show or The Super Mario Bros. 3 Show? The game was a masterpiece and will become one of the greatest platformers of all time. The animated show... Eh. I will give it this, the episodes made more sense than the last Mario cartoon, but that's not saying much. The animation looks a little bit better too. This show had a total of 26 episodes. DIC Animation decided to tackle the next Super Mario cartoon without, say, Young Animation Studios, when they made Super Mario World in 1991. The show was, of course, based on the very successful Super Mario World for the Super NES. It introduced Yoshi as a side character to the regular four core characters. This show, for some reason, is not talked about much, ever, and it's way better than the first two shows. The characters still look the same from the last two cartoons, but Yoshi is the breakthrough character here. As with the last Mario show, this one was also part of the Captain N show, and it only had 13 episodes. Now, this next entry is a bit of a questionable one. Power Team is a show based off a video game, actually four to be exact, but the episodes were shorts that ran inside the show called Video Power. The Power Team show comprised of four video game characters from different titles. First was Kuros from the game Wizards and Warriors. Second was Max, the title character from NARC. Third was Tyrone, one of the characters from the sports game Arch Rivals. And Quirk from the game Qu Quirk. It also included the truck Bigfoot, which was a popular oversized monster truck that also had an NES game. They battled Mr. Big and some of his goons from the game NARC. Sometimes even the wizard Malkil, what's his name, Malkil? How do you pronounce that? From Wizards and Warriors would make an appearance. The animation on this one was actually pretty damn good. And unfortunately, only 26 episodes were ever made.
1993 was a busy year for animated shows based on video games. First one up is The Adventures of Sonic the Hedgehog. This show ran for 65 episodes. It showcased Sonic and Tails as they battled Dr. Robotnik and his minions. The animation was done by, again, DIC Studios. Little trivia on this one is that Jaleel White voiced Sonic. And you might be asking yourself, who the hell is Jaleel White? Can I do that? Yeah, that guy. To be a dragon, you gotta be strong. Humble, never bragging. Next up in that same year is Double Dragon. After setting the arcades on fire back in the late 80s and early 90s, it was only the right thing to do to come up with an animated show where you beat the living snot out of your enemies. DIC Animation brought this game to the smallest TV screen. Taking a page out of the NES storyline, the brothers are enemies since they were separated at birth, with Billy training under a martial arts master and Jimmy is brought up by the shadow master. The show started off with the brothers as enemies, but they soon team up to battle the Shadow Boss. This show ran for 26 episodes and spanned all the way into 1994. Last up for 1993, we got Sonic the Hedgehog. No, this is not the same show as the one previously mentioned. It is not a follow-up or a sequel to the first show. This one has a more dark tone when compared to the original Sonic show. In this one, Sonic is in charge of a group of rebels who are trying to free the world from Robotnik after he becomes a dictator, I guess, and are at constant war with him and his goons. Sonic is still paired with Tails, and this series introduces all new characters to aid them in their fight. This show right here ran for 26 episodes all the way into 1994. And in 1994, Ruby Spears produced a Mega Man animated series, done by animation studios Ashi Productions based in Japan. This show was pretty faithful to the games, showing a more serious oriented character design when compared to the original Mega Man artwork. The animation was truly something to behold, it was pretty good. There was a pilot for this show that had a totally different animation style and character designs. One that stuck more closely to the original NES Mega Man artwork from Japan. Why they didn't stick with this one was blamed on budget restraints. The show went on to use the redesigned characters. And while that's not bad at all, I think it would have fared better using the artwork from the original pilot. Titled Appearance in Japan. You can find that in YouTube easily. While the show will go on to great reviews and consistent viewership, it got cancelled after two seasons. In total, this show had 27 episodes. Hey, at least it didn't look like this. In that same year, we had Where in the World is Carmen Sandiego. Now, if you had a PC in the late 80s and very early 90s, you know exactly who I'm talking about. This original game had come out in 1985 but only started to really gain popularity as PC sales grew and more computers found their way into homes. This game was a great way to learn about geography and other small facts from around the world. The cartoon was about two young agents as they chased Carmen throughout the world. The show is depicted as being a computer game that a young boy is playing on his PC, with that portion of the show being a live action segment. You never see his face either. This show proved to be very popular and lasted four seasons on Fox. The animation was actually pretty damn good and was done by DIC Studios. A total of 40 episodes were released through the show's run. It's nice to see the PC finally get an animated show treatment after all other titles on this list so far have been on consoles and arcade games. Little trivia, the great Rita Moreno provided the voice for Carmen Sandiego. Supernatural things, magic and sorcery, they're back. 
From out of the gloom, stalk your worst nightmares, ghouls, zombies. Fighting games were all the rage in the early and mid 90s. Darkstalkers had been a Capcom game that mixed the fighting genre with that of horror themed characters. A pretty cool idea in my book. And the show was released in 1995. Surprising that Street Fighter didn't get the TV treatment first over this title. Whatever, some characters' backstories had to be changed and the overall violence had to be toned down for the younger audience, of course. The show also created a new character, the protagonist named Harry Grimoire. He battles Dimitri and Morgana with the help of Felicia. The show was animated by Grass Entertainment and it ran for only one season with a total of, I'm not making this up, 13 episodes. Earthworm Jim! The soil he did crawl! Earthworm Jim! A super suit did fall! Jim was just a dirt eating, chewing length of worm flesh, but all that came to a crashing game. <laughs> Another game getting the TV treatment in 95 was none other than Earthworm Jim. The games had been a huge hit for Shiny Entertainment, and the game had all the elements to make a great cartoon. Universal Cartoon Studios, with the help from Acom, FlexTech, Television Limited, and Shiny Entertainment released 23 episodes during the show's two seasons. It kept that zany humor of the game down to the last cow drop. The villains from the game all make appearances and Peter Puppy is Jim's partner. Princess... Uh, what's her name? I forget what it is. She's in it too. Little trivia, Dan Castellaneta who is widely known for doing Homer Simpson's voice, also does Jim's voice. Colonel William Giles, one of the greatest martial artists in the world, travels the global... Street Fighter did get the TV treatment, just one month after Darkstalkers. Not going to go into detail since it's Street Fighter, who doesn't know about it. The cartoon just follows the Street Fighter live-action movie in that it makes Guile the main character and it keeps Chun Li as another major character, and just like in the movie, she's a reporter. Surprisingly, Ryu and Ken are not the focal points of the TV show, but rather side characters in a way. Tons of characters from the game would show up in the show. There is one episode where they even team up with the characters from the Final Fight game, blending the Final Fight and Street Fighter universes together. The animation, it's not so great on this one. It was done by the same people who brought you Darkstalkers. The show lasted two seasons and produced 26 episodes. So while we at America got this, Japan got this. Yeah, that's bullcrap. Much has changed since the last Mortal Kombat tournament. Dark forces of Outworld have begun invading the Earth realm. These attacks are seriously weakening Earth's dimensional fabric, enabling not only Outworlders to enter the Earth realm, but warriors. Oh, and speaking of fighting games, Mortal Kombat also got the TV treatment in 1996. I'm surprised that it took that long. This show aired in the USA network and was produced by Film Roman Animation Studios. It closely follows the game in that it involved the majority of the characters from the game pretty faithfully. The plot is similar to that of the game, so if you were a fan of the game, then this show was kind of right up your alley. It had a little bit of that Batman animated series look to it. Unfortunately, that didn't help. It ran only for one season and had only 13 episodes. And bound by honor, these are the defenders of the realm. Wing Commander also got the TV treatment in 1996. This was based off the PC game series Wing Commander that originated in 1990. The game was a flight simulator that utilized great graphics and speech to bring to life the space struggles of various factions in space. But I digress. The animated show was taken from the Wing Commander Academy game sequel that was released in 1993 for PC. According to online articles, this show is loosely based on the game series with many of the ships from the game being shown and even introducing new classes of fighters and frigates. I'll be honest with you, I have never played any Wing Commander game, but after researching for this video, I'm starting to think I need to change that. 
Donkey Kong Country had made huge waves when it got released on the Super Nintendo. With its use of amazing graphics and great platforming, it was only a matter of time before we would get another Donkey Kong animated show. And so Donkey Kong Country, the show, debuted in 1997. Now, unlike other shows in this list, this one was created using CGI to closely match the tone and feel of the 16-bit games. Due to the early work on such graphics for an animated show, they can seem very outdated today, but it was the first to incorporate this style. In this show, Donkey Kong finds, I don't know, some kind of a magic coconut and, you know, blah blah blah. Look, the point is, it's a Donkey Kong show, okay? And it only ran for two seasons and had a total of 40 episodes. I wanna be the very best, like no one ever was. To catch them is my real test, to train them is my cause. I will travel across the land, searching far and wide. He's talking my now this next one here is a little show by the name of Pokemon that will make its debut in Japan in 1997 before it spread across the globe shortly after. This show is still going on today and will probably exist in different variations until the world ends. Pretty sure of that. I recall watching some of the episodes from the initial season with the Squirtle Squad episode being one of my favorites. My son was a fan back then and is still a fan today as a young adult. That alone gives you an idea on the staying power of this franchise. If you've never seen any of the Pokemon cartoons, I have no idea where you've been living all this time. Rayman had been a surprise hit when it came out across multiple platforms in 1995. It was a good side platformer with some sweet animations and solid gameplay. The cartoony vibe of the game just screamed that it'd be picked up for the TV treatment. But Rayman didn't take the cartoonish animation approach, but rather went with the CGI animation that was starting to take off in the late 90s. Rayman, the animated series, debuted in 1999 and has that same look that Donkey Kong Country animated show had. This show had the shortest stint out of all the shows listed here so far. According to online info, there were 26 episodes made, but only 4 of them were broadcasted on TV before being canned. The show was produced by Ubisoft themselves. Now supposedly the VHS and DVD copies of the animated series are extremely hard to find, so good luck with that one if you want to get your hands on one. Sonic Underground is the third animated Sonic cartoon and was released in 1999. So this show was produced by DIC Studios and follows Sonic and his two siblings, Sonia and Manic as they... Wait, wait, is that correct? Wait, Sonic has a brother and sister? Why? When? What the f... Okay, okay, let me just finish this. Sonic and his two siblings were part of a royal family that were separated from their mother, Queen Alina, after Dr. Robotnik took over... What the hell? Who wrote this? The same guy who came up with that Sonichu guy? Okay, I'm done with this one. You know what? Go look it up in Wikipedia because it gets kind of detailed. It lasted only for one season, big shocker. But it had a total of 40 episodes. It is now 2201. Radical advances in transportation technology have transformed the world. Interplanetary travel has put mankind in touch with new planets, new life forms, new dangers. And a thrilling new sport grips the galaxy, fueled by fans across the universe and driven by the need for speed. In 2003, we would get a cartoon based off the F Zero franchise called F Zero GP Legends. This show was originally released in Japan, 
but it was released here in the States as well, and it ran for 15 episodes before being cancelled. In Japan, the show ran for a whopping 51 episodes. It incorporated animation with CGI graphics for the racing portion, so much like the F-Zero franchise, this anime was largely forgotten over time. Did you ever hear of it? I didn't, until I was researching for this video. Why does Nintendo hate F-Zero so much? Why Nintendo? That same year, another Sonic cartoon would debut. Thank the lord, because we sure didn't have enough of them before. This one was originally made in Japan and broadcasted in the States. The animation on this one is a vast improvement over the last few Sonic cartoon outings. The characters were kept intact from the games, as well as the overall feel of it. The show was a huge hit and ran for a total of 3 seasons and totaled 78 episodes. If you were a Sonic fan, you had to be proud and relieved that for maybe one of the few times in gaming history, the Sonic brand had a 1-up on the Mario brand. It's party time! In 2006, Viva Piñata was released on the Xbox 360, a game about piñatas and their island habitat. Okay, are we running out of games and ID? Okay, you know what? Let me continue. The game is quirky, I'll give it that, but alongside the release of the game was the animated show. It used computer animation to keep the look and feel as close to the game as possible. And by 2006, that technology and animation had advanced so much that this feat was pretty easy to accomplish. The show was produced by three companies in total. 4Kids Entertainment, Bardell Entertainment, and Microsoft. I don't think anyone outside 10 kids in the Western Hemisphere cared about the storyline here, so I'm not gonna go over it. A total of 26 episodes were created. Now, Tack and the Power of the Juju was a game I never played, but I saw the box and ads for it everywhere I went. It's one of those game covers that you immediately recognize, but I gather that most of us out there have not played. It's an action 3D platformer by THQ and was released in North America in 2003. Nickelodeon decided to bring this game to the TV screen in 2007. It kept the same look and feel of the game. The majority of the voice cast did not transfer over to the TV show except for Patrick Warburton. Now you might be asking yourself, who the hell is Patrick Warburton? You got a question. You ask the Epa. In that same year, Day One Media released Magi Nation a cartoon based off a video game that was developed by Imaginative Entertainment back in 2001 for the Game Boy Advance. But that video game was based on a card game called Magi Nation Duel that was released all the way back in 2000. The show follows Tony Jones, a young boy who is considered to be the final dreamer and must recover the dream stones that will help him stop the evil Agram before he can escape from his dark prison. Never heard of this game, never heard of the card game. This show here had 52 episodes produced, but into season number 2, the show was cancelled before the last 12 episodes could air. From what I read online, all episodes can now be found in Tubi for free. Now this next one here is a bit tricky. Ape Escape is a video game, so that's not the issue. The issue is that the game did not get a fully animated cartoon made, but rather several animated shorts, very short, that were created by Federator Studios in 2009. The shorts are actually quite funny and quick paced and mostly made using Adobe Flash for the animation. I love the monkey faces, they're just 
oblivious to everything. And Federator Studios released 38 shorts in total. Ah, uh, remember those annoying phone and tablet app games where you would download some animals that recorded your voice and just repeated what you said back to you, but in a funny voice? Characters Animation and Disney, yes, Disney, decided to bring these animals to the screen with Talking Friends in 2012. This is not a TV series, but rather a web series that was released on YouTube and Disney.com. There were only 10 episodes made before it ended in that same year. And I think I'm not alone here when I say, thank goodness, there were only 10. In 2013, 33 years after Pac-Man first aired on Saturday morning as part of the cartoon lineup, we got a new Pac-Man animated series titled Pac-Man and the Ghostly Adventures. This show is not a reboot of the old show, but it's a newer reimagining of the Pac-Man lore. And in this one, Pac-Man is the last of his kind, basically yellow packs that are able to eat ghosts. This show was pretty popular and ran for three seasons, 51 episodes in all. Sonic, once again, burst onto the animated TV scene with Sonic Boom. This show was the first Sonic cartoon to be made using only CGI. This one has Sonic, Tails, Knuckles, Amy, and Sticks, all from the Sonic Boom game. The story and art are in line with the game as well. The show ran for two seasons and had a total of 104 total episodes, that's a lot. The cartoon was praised as being one of the best of the Sonic cartoons, but uh, that's not a huge accomplishment. But it's a good cartoon. The writing and the humor are quick and witty for the most part on this one. Ooh, let me see. Oh wait, I can't read. Give me that. Now this next entry is Skylanders Academy. Based off the Skylanders game where you bought like those little amiibo type NFC figures to unlock characters and features in the game, the cartoon released in 2016 was a spin-off from the game storyline and was in full CGI. The cartoon follows Spyro, Stealth Elf, and Eruptor as they enroll into Skylanders Academy. I'm not gonna get into more, and I'll leave it as that. Now how the hell do you make a cartoon out of this over here? Fruit Ninja? The tablet or phone game, meant to distract you for a couple of seconds at most, somehow got the animated series treatment when it was released under the YouTube Red banner with the name Fruit Ninja Frenzy Force in 2017. Based on info from IMDB, this show had only 13 episodes. Not surprised. Welcome to your new favorite reality game show. We're five brave teams from different Minecraft got a series treatment when Minecraft miniseries premiered in the Mattel YouTube channel as a web series in 2017. The story follows that of a survival type game show where teams compete for prices in some kind of a secluded island. The episodes were very short and only 16 were made. The show keeps the same type of graphics as the game. It was made by Mojang Studios with the help from Mattel, Xbox Game Studios and Atomic Cartoon Studios. Now, Netflix had already done Skylanders Academy on their platform, so video game themed series was not a new thing to them. But this next one was a big deal, mainly because this franchise had been around the gaming industry for just under 30 years when this show debuted it in 2017. Castlevania would finally, finally get an animated series. The show centers around Trevor Belmont as he gets help from Sophia and Alucard in helping him take down Dracula just like in Castlevania 3. Clearly, this one here is not for the kiddies. This series takes a graphical, violent approach into its storytelling. The show has only four seasons and 32 episodes, but it made a huge impact. I had not watched it until I started working on this video and oh man, why did I wait? What makes a hero? 
2018, we got another chance at a Mega Man animated series with this release of Mega Man Fully Charged on the Cartoon Network. Characters were all redesigned for the series, but the backstory is a bit of a spin-off from the original Mega Man lore. The show, it only ran for one season, but it had a whopping 52 episodes. And if that wasn't enough, after the show ended, the characters and the story continued in a short comic book series that debuted in 2020. And finally, we have on the list here, Freddy and Friends on Tour, a web series created by Steel Wool Studios. The web shorts are only a minute or minute and a half long and had only four episodes made to coincide with the release of the video game Five Nights at Freddy's Security Breach. The feel and animation of the show was made to resemble old stock cartoon shows from the 70s and 80s with laugh tracks added for the effect. Pricing that the show took this approach and did not go with the standard CGI used in the majority of the animated series made after Donkey Kong Country. While not a breakthrough hit, it was a breath of fresh air among other video game cartoon adaptations. These web shorts all debuted on 2021. To think that we went from this and eventually ended up almost exactly where we started in 2021 using standard animation. Now there are a few more titles that are new, such as Rabbit's Invasion, Subway Surfers, a new Carmen San Diego cartoon. What if Carmen San Diego were a thief? Costume Quest. Arcane, which is based off League of Legends. Don't understand what's at stake. Power doesn't come to those who are born strongest. This and Angry Birds easy. Summer of Madness. We here first. You want to fight for it? Oh, please say yes. Even Dota. And to think that there's still new animated shows being created such as Sonic Prime, a new Earthworm Jim cartoon, Kingdom Hearts and a series based on Watch Dogs. 42 years worth of animated shows influenced by video games from almost all genres. What are some of your favorite animated series? What is the worst you have seen? Let me know in the comment section. Stay tuned for more great content. Keep watching, keep gaming, and as always, take care of yourselves. Listen, you were sleeping, so I opened the stomach hatch and climbed inside.